so my remarks will start with what I want to do, uh, second, why I want to do it, third, what's happening uh, with respect to the wet technology, uh, some of the issues that come up, a proposal, and that'll be it. Uh, what I want to do, I'd like to develop tools that make biology easy to engineer. Uh, by biology, I mean the stuff of life, so little bacteria that swim around, make chemicals, perhaps someday go into your body and fix stuff up. I also mean the stuff of life like this, uh, larger objects, mammals, what have you, bring them back, change them. And then once we get all that working, maybe other things too, although that might be uh, more than 10 or 20 years from now. So spaceships that self-assemble ecosystems or uh, Trey Parker's uh, polygluteal uh, monkeys. <laughs> In other words, uh, how do we take this material, uh, the one part of nature for which engineering, as Stuart mentioned, has not really yet been well developed and turn it into an engineerable substrate such that were it ever possible to make gigantic programmable gourds that differentiate into four bedroom, two bath houses, we could do that. These are ideas obviously and it's not clear that the substrate of biology is a physical material, chemical material will support all of this, but one can imagine. What do I want to do? Part two, tools that enable humanity. It seems to be irresponsible to set out to rebuild the living world, if it were, uh, without also understanding who we are and what we intend to do with that capability. So for example, tools that support conversation. This is a slide of a website from Paul Rabinow's group at Berkeley, trying to bring people together to talk about some of the issues with making biology easier to engineer. Tools that enable the sharing of wisdom. So if we have tens of thousands of years with biology as a tool for us, as a source of food, how do we take advantage of that, or at least continue to recognize and celebrate that? Tools for building a community. So if this is a photograph of students from Lincoln High School here in San Francisco working at UCSF, I was a teenage genetic engineer last summer, they say. Is that good or bad? And how do we give these students a future that they can build for themselves where they can take responsibility for the direct manipulation of genetic material? Tools for safety. If this is the Subway newspaper from 30 years ago in Boston, where they were publishing recipes for how to clone a toxin in your kitchen, is that a good or bad thing to do? Uh, how come people didn't come forward doing this, or did they kill themselves trying so we didn't hear about them? Tools for security. If this is a publicly accessible sequence for a genome that happens to encode uh, hemorrhagic fever like Ebola, and you could each download it from the internet and purchase the DNA encoding it for $20,000. Do we secure a world based on biology in which that's possible or not? Tools that enable beauty, beauty both human constructed and inspired by what we see in nature. So those are the two things that I'm arguing for, tools that make biology easier to engineer and tools that enable humanity. Why do I want to do this? One, to understand. You can take apart a car in order to understand a car, and that gives you some sort of understanding. But then if you take the pieces as they're scattered about your driveway and attempt to put them back together, you might have a couple pieces left over. You'll have an aha moment when you turn the key, and it might work or it might not. Basically, in biology, in its modern era, over the last 70 years, we've inherited a reductionist approach driven by physicists starting around 1930 and this became molecular biology and genetics. We've gotten really, really good at taking natural biological systems, pulling them apart, studying their individual components, reading out their DNA, but we don't actually understand how all those components yet go back together. And so one of the real reasons I'd like to do this is to understand, learning by building. And just as an example of how bad we are in terms of understanding natural biological systems, I'll show you this little movie. Uh, that's a research project that will be published from my lab. These are a movie of bacteria, E. coli, growing and dividing. And all the cells have been infected, excuse me, two of the cells have been infected with a virus. And they'll turn green, the two infected cells. And you'll see one of the cells popped. The virus is so tiny you can't see it, but you can see it destroys the cell. And the other cell just keeps growing and dividing. This is for a virus that was first isolated from nature in the 1950s. Its genome was read out, 48,502 base pairs in the 1980s. So if you've heard of the company 23andMe for studying human DNA, you could have had a company for this virus back in uh, uh, the Reagan years. We have no idea why one cell will pop and the other cell will continue to survive. We have some stories. 
but no biophysical models. So by learning how to put these things back together, by taking the pieces as the biologists have described them as these little entities and trying to reassemble them, we might learn that our models of how these things are actually parts, though they're not quite parts like we think they are. Another reason I'm excited and I'm arguing for getting better at engineering biology, uh, developing tools that support that and tools that support humanity is to enable what I'll call sustainable agility as well as artistry, and that might not be the right word, I might mean just simply beauty. In terms of sustainable agility, folks might have seen this before, this is a comparison of before and after corn or maize. Uh, on the left you see corn prior to domestication. And then on the right, something that's more familiar. If you look at the foods that we eat, uh, we eat very few of the things that are edible uh, so far as plants are concerned. And so one thing I might uh, hope for for the future is agility with respect to domesticating or whatever the equivalent is, different crops, both as the environment exists today and perhaps in a changing environment. Toolkit. So what are some of the technologies that exist today? Well, to put this in context, we've lived in a world where for the last human generation, the last 35 years, there's been, since the invention of recombinant DNA, uh, the birth of the modern biotechnology industry, companies like Genentech here in the San Francisco area. And these are the tools, if you will, of genetic engineering, some of the most basic tools. Recombinant DNA lets you take two existing pieces of DNA and cut and paste them, making a new molecule that might do something useful, such as produce insulin in bacteria, so you get that drug more reliably in service of treating diabetes. Polymerase chain reaction, the second old tool, lets you take a single molecule of DNA and make many, many copies of it, so it's more easy to do stuff. And then sequencing of DNA lets you take a molecule and then read it out, getting access to the information. These are not the only tools that can power uh, the engineering of biology, and much of what I view synthetic biology to be about is the invention and implementation of new tools. So, for example, construction of DNA. Rather than manually manipulating DNA with enzymes, let me just have it constructed to order. Biology is oftentimes very complex. Maybe I can abstract it and simplify it. I'll give you examples of four and five. And then this turns out to be a very radical idea. Maybe we could standardize biology so that the component tree can be reused more easily. Here's some specific examples. So DNA construction. It turns out that back in 1982, chemists working in Colorado more or less perfected at the time a chemistry called phosphoramidite chemistry. And what this means is you can buy in jars chemicals today which are derived from sugarcane. And these chemicals end up being the four bases of DNA or phosphoramidites in a form that can be uh, readily assembled. So four of these bottles up at the top here, one would be a bottle of A, T, C, and G, and so on. And you hook these bottles up to a machine. Into the machine comes information from a computer, a sequence of DNA. T, A, A, T, A, whatever you'd like to build, and that machine will stitch the genetic material together from scratch. So if you've ever seen Star Trek where they have the food replicating system, and you know, I'd like a pumpkin spiced mocha or a latte or something, and you can compile that from the warp energy drive, or I don't know exactly how it works. Uh, DNA synthesis is the equivalent technology. You take information and material and you compile, you take information in the raw chemicals, you compile genetic material. It's, practically speaking, the coolest, most impressive slash scary technology I've encountered. DNA is complicated. So if we were to do all our genetic engineering at this level of resolution, TAA, TA, CGA, CTC, ACTA, TA, GGA, GA, it would become tedious, uh, if not uh, unreliable. It would be akin, perhaps, uh, the analogy is not perfect, uh, perhaps like programming a computer in machine language. At some point, uh, it might be good to know how to do that, but oftentimes people would like to program at a higher level. And so some of these ideas, like abstraction of genetic componentry, involves the idea of taking these different layers of function, the DNA layer, and putting on top of that a parts layer, where we could call genetic objects that just do something, and you don't have to know all of the sequence information. And then we might be able to build still higher level functional objects, like a device that could receive or send information or smell like bananas or make a balloon. And then maybe we could have a system, uh, makes a drug, swims around, finds a tumor and attacks it, who knows? 